You are listening to the Lucha Central Podcast Network. And now, Lucha Central Weekly. Welcome to another edition of the Lucha Central Weekly Podcast. This is the podcast that lets you know all the latest happening in the world of Lucha Libre. We cover news and events from the week that was talking Mexico-based promotions and top independents, along with Luchador-related news from throughout the United States. The Lucha Central Weekly Podcast is part of the Lucha Central Podcast Network. On LuchaCentral.com, this podcast and others from the network are also available on all major podcast streaming platforms, including iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Podbay, Speaker, and much, much more. My name is Miranda Morales, and I'm one of the co-hosts of the Lucha Central Weekly Podcast, and let me bring in the rest of the team. Introducing first, he is the dashing one, Mr. Dusty Murphy. Dusty, how's it going? Oh, it's going fantastic. How's it going for you, Miranda? It is going so well. Happy New Year to you, and Happy New Year to the third member of our team, and that's who? Who? Oh? Who? It is the one and only Brendan Barr. That's yeah. who? This is exciting. I've been ready for this one. This is... We we took a little bit of a break while doing this, and I just was marinating over what I was gonna, how I was gonna do this. So I'm excited to get going. Yes, and what you may be asking, well, that is our end of year awards. We went over all of our nominees back at the end of 2022, and now we're in a new year, new us, and we are now going to be going over our picks in our six different categories, plus a bonus category for all of you. We're excited to be sharing our thoughts and our picks for categories like our Rising Star of the Year, Trios of the Year, Tag Team of the Year, Luchador and Luchador of the Year, and, of course, Match of the Year. We talked about it. We voted. And now we're going to be giving you all of our results so make sure that you stay tuned to it before though we get into all of our picks we are going to kick it off to denise salcedo who brings us this week's lucha central central why should you visit the chairshot.com the chairshot.com is your home for hard-hitting reviews news opinion and analysis with attitude why because you're smarter than the average fan TheChairShot.com. Always use your head. Hey everyone, it's Denise Salcedo here in Lucha Central Central with a reminder of where and when to catch all of the great network content this week. Get the full lineup and listen to all of our shows in the podcast network section of LuchaCentral.com. On Tuesdays, Mass, Mats, and Mayhem takes you inside the world of Lucha Underground as they take you weekly through the series with the benefit of hindsight and the benefit of special guests from the groundbreaking series. Check out the premiere video stream every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern on the Lucha Central YouTube channel and at LuchaCentral.com. Then listen to it on your favorite podcast platform every Wednesday. Tuesday night's live is Wrestle Boss, where Fabi Chulo talks MMA and pro wrestling with special guests and listener Collins. Visit WrestleBossLive.com Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific to listen live or call in with questions or download the show on podcast platforms on Wednesdays. Wednesday nights live on Facebook, it's Spanish show La Mesa de los Margaros, giving you both the news and the cheese made from around the lucha world. Special guests and a whole lot of fun make it one of the most talked about shows in Mexico. Thursdays, it's straight out of the bodega with Papo Esco and PWR promoter Gabriel Ramirez as they have guests from throughout the wrestling world pull up to give an inside look into their careers. 
From indie standouts to television superstars, each week brings a new name and perspective. On Friday, it's your double dose of Lucha Central Weekly podcast. One in English y el otro en español. Lucha Central Weekly is where you'll find all the top stories of the week, both inside and out of the ring from Mexico and anywhere luchadores are in action across the globe. Be sure to subscribe and follow all your favorite Lucha Central Network series on your favorite podcast platforms, either by their own series name or subscribe to the Lucha Central Podcast Network show pages to get all of the shows in one easy feed. And please consider giving a rating to help more fans find the shows that you love. For now, this is Denise Salcedo signing off from Lucha Central Central. Have a great week. Lucha-Masks.com by Pro Wrestling Revolution. Bringing you in partnership with Mask Republic, the Lucha Brothers, as well as Japanese legend Ultimo Dragon. Go to Lucha-Masks.com and fight Lucha Strong with masks from your favorite Lucha legends and pro wrestling revolution luchadores. Stay safe in style and represent your favorite luchador. Get yours now at Lucha-Masks.com, powered by Pro Wrestling Revolution. Always a very big thank you to Denise Alcedo bringing us this week's Lucha Central Central, letting you know what's happening throughout the Lucha Central Podcast Network. So, end of year. Now, if you haven't already, go and see or see or listen to our previous episode where we went over each of the nominees for our different categories. And by the way, this is now the third annual end of year awards for the Lucha Central Weekly Podcast. So we are excited once again to be bringing you our picks. Before we get into our winners, Brendan and Dusty, I just want to get your thoughts on what's it like or what are your thoughts on the fact that we are now hitting three years of these end-of-year awards and also kind of talk a little bit, you know, without revealing too much, was it harder or easier than you thought in maybe picking some of these names or in casting your votes? What was that process like for you? Uh, it was harder for me this year than it was the last couple of years. The I think during the pandemic, the, the highlights in wrestling were fewer and more spaced out, and so they had more chance to stand out, but I think we found this year that there were a lot of like dark horse contenders for each category that were really cool that we didn't really see before. Not as many obvious choices this year. There were a couple of winners that surprised me. And so even though we've done this a couple of times, it still felt different this year. Kind of exciting. Oh, yeah. So first off, it's surreal for the three years, but particularly because during lockdown, even though we were only doing this once a week it felt lockdown felt like forever so like in some ways this feels like year five in other ways this feels like year one so uh uh but and then yeah the, for me the um the nomination process was much harder this year i need to be much more aggressive with my note taking next year or this 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 now year so that we can, I can really feel confident in it. Because uh, that, to Dusty's point, there was so many moments that stood out mm-hmm. in previous years that made it easy. Yeah. Whereas this year, there was just a ton of uh, moments that all stood out, and it just became a big flood of things. Uh, so, what made the cut? What didn't make the cut? What did I forget that I should have nominated? That sort of thing. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that I think was where I got stuck too. I'm sure there were so many things we could have nominated or, or people or matches in particular. And so it is one where you think you're going to remember and then it comes to the time and you're like, oh man, there's so much I forgot. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but I, I one category we had it easy on was our bonus award. So do you want to? Yeah, I feel like, Brendan, I'd love for you to uh, help me introduce our bonus category, uh, which is the Cookie Sheet Award. Yes. And, Brendan, provide a little context to our listeners about the Cookie Sheet Award. Well, so we joked a lot, particularly during the the time where we were able to do Triple Mania live coverage, or not, we did a, a co-feed with Triple Mania, which failed on synchronization and technical issues, but... 
cookie war cookie sheets have become kind of one of our go tos. We know that in a lot of AAA matches and a lot of uh, independent lucha libre, when things get out of hand, somehow cookie sheets manage to make it into the ring. Uh, you know, which is just bizarre and funny and awkward, but still awesome because nothing sounds quite like a cookie sheet ricocheting off of Chessman's back. Just, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I thought this would be a fantastic award for things that embodied a lot of that, like a person who was over the top, super, still super enter- entertaining, engaging, and, uh, and, and, Ridiculous moments. Uh, I believe last year Angel Garza had several, at least nominations. I, I don't remember. And, you know, and this year's uh, award winner for the cookie sheet is in the same vein of kind of ridiculousness. Yeah, uh, I I uh, agree as far as uh, <laughs> the ridiculousness aspect of lucha libre. And uh, this person in general <laughs> highlights all of our favorite ridiculous moments uh, in in this year's uh, Cookie Shoot Award. All right. Since you and I have talked about it, let's have Dusty introduce the Cookie Sheet Minute. Yes. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, ridic- the most ridiculous moment of the year, the Cookie Sheet Award, tied. We had two moments. The first moment, Micro Man, he was in a trios match with Taya and I'm drawing a blank. But he was in a trios match anyway <laughs> and against Strange Song Gray and he was getting beat down. Sandman comes out. It was Lindsay Dorado. Now I remember. Yes. I'm, Let's say Dorado and tie up Micro Man in a trio against Strange Song Gray. And uh, he was getting beaten down. Luckily, he was saved. Who came to his rescue? Sandman from ECW. They were at the 2300 Arena. I guess he just hangs around backstage. <laughs> came to the rescue. Whooped the tar out of everybody with his kendo stick. And then he grabs Micro Man a micro beer. But Micro Man doesn't want a micro beer. He wants a goddamn tall boy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's a man. <laughs> He's only micro in size, not micro in manhood. He wants yes. a big beer, y'all. And so the the show ended with them toasting their beers. It was quite a moment. Very cool. Then we also had Micro Man in a suitcase in MLW. <laughs> if you have not seen Micro Man jump out of the suitcase, you've got to. I'm pretty sure that you could probably Google Micro Man suitcase MLW and it would bring it up. It, it's hilarious. Micro Man had an amazing year. He used his size to his advantage. Um, I believe just this last weekend he had a match against Enzo, who is now a real one. Formerly Enzo Amore. I mean, he he has just been on a roll this year. He has made the most out of his, I don't want to say out of his size, but out of his, you know, I mean, he has used his abilities to the zenith. And he just funny. His dad is Kimonito from CMLL, the original Luce, if you remember that, but Kimonito big deal. They kind of expected Microman to be Kimonito Jr. going forward. Kimonito's retiring this year from CMLL, but Microman is, you know, arguably more famous now, especially in the United States, than Kimonito is. Mm-hmm. And His so you feeling is it's much higher, yeah. Sorry. Much higher. His physical abilities and his timing and charisma are just higher than Kimonito's. Um, you know, he plays up to the crowd in a bigger, better way. I feel he's less of a cuddly teddy bear and, and more of a kick-ass little dude. And, you know, he just doesn't mess around. It's a completely different vibe. And I really think that, the, you know, we're going to see a lot of Microban this year. And I think he's going to capitalize on his talent because it, he's he's climbing up. I mean, if you had told me, like, it, what – 
a year ago that he'd have a match against Enzo, I'd be like, eh, I don't know, that sounds like a gimmicky match. It still sounds funny, but like you could credibly see him winning now. It doesn't, I mean, it's not what it was. So it's very exciting, very good news. But also, like we said, he embraces the silly moments. He's willing to be in on the joke. And that's incredible. So many wrestlers take themselves seriously. And by embracing that and bringing the kind of comedy side of Lucha to the United States, he's doing something very unique and special, which I really like. Yeah, and just MLW put Microman in a position where, you know, of course he's, he's very big on all the comedy, but in general, just someone who, um, is just hilarious. Just, just really, really funny. And, um, he's found a really good place in MLW. Just, um, and these are kind of two of the bigger skits, but he's had, you know, even just, uh, recently, towards the end of the year, he was in a, um, a promo with Fatu, um, you know, just drinking and celebrating. Lince, uh, bringing out a mini robe for, uh, uh, for him and Microman. Definitely feel like that's good tag team material, but just the, the level of prominence he's been put in MLW, um, is, is pretty big. Probably, um, more than any other luchador. Um, this year, you know, well, and, you. and the Indies, because yeah. he was at uh, SummerSlam, I believe the the not at SummerSlam, but, you know, the, the weekend yeah. and stuff. And uh, he was pretty high on the card on every American show, indie show I saw him booked on. So he's yeah, he, he is leveraging everything at this point. That's you got it. He's also got really cool gear this year. I mean, got a Mario inspired, like Super Mario 3, but it's, you know, <laughs> he's flying, like Microman flying through the yeah. air. It's, it's incredible. I have the shirt, like, you can't, can't pass it up if you see it. It's too good. And I really think he's got it figured out. Well, a very big congratulations to this year's winner of the Cookie Shoot Award, Microman. <laughs> Salute. Pound for pound. There you go. The world yeah. of Luchador. Yes. Uh, so we are going to be getting into our uh, regular categories. First off is our Rising Star of the Year. We had five nominees in this category, uh, starting off with our first trios um, ever nominated. Nueva Generacion Dinamita. Uh, Commander, also nominated. <laughs> Dominic Mysterio. Lindsay Dorado. And Black Taurus. So our honorable mention in this category is Commander, uh, who had a really big U.S. breakthrough year. After that, our third place winner is Nuevo Generacion Dinamita. Right behind there in second place, Dominic Mysterio. And in first place, Black Taurus. I want to get your thoughts on this. This was, I think, one of the harder harder categories. This was super, yeah. super hard. I'm a little surprised how this one turned out. Um, so I love Black Taurus. I'm super happy that we all seem to have thought that he was worthy of points. But if you look at where his career is at versus where Commander is right now and where Dominic is right now and even NGD – Yes. Him, him getting the the top spot is you know is pretty impressive because uh, it really is. Yeah, um, I, I just wanted there was a there was a quote on Twitter that I wanted to get out of there because uh, a Lucha blog posted during the Battle of Los Angeles that it was weird to see Commander in in a match with Bandito where essentially this was a kind of a rematch of Bandito versus Flamita from a previous. Bola, where it was obvious who was on the rise and who was the guy that was going to kind of help him get there. And uh, I just thought that was... It felt validating to me that <laughs> someone else who follows Lucha very closely has a very similar opinion to me. Yeah, um, yeah go ahead, Dusty. 
Well, um, yeah, big year for Black Horse. I was shocked that he won first place. I, I thought he was going to be a strong second. I really thought Dominic was going to get the first place win. Uh, I'll be honest, he was my vote for first place. <laughs> but and and it, to be fair, at the time that we did the voting and everything, we had not yet seen Prison Dominic. True. <laughs> and, well, Prison Prison Dom is technically 2023, so yes, I feel yeah. like you it know made we him did ineligible. Yeah. Yes. That was, yes. That was uh, kind to, of what I was referencing though when yeah. I said where they're at. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. had to we had to call, cut a very clear line, and um, yes, I would say now the the voting was very close between Dominic and Black Taurus. But I think in some ways it's very different comparisons. You know, I think personality yeah. wise and per, and, um, you know, uh, uh, persona wise, Dominic, you know, really blew everyone out of the water. But I think for Black Taurus performance wise, um, and, and all of the big promotions he was in this year, um, I think maybe that's, that's where he got a little bit more of the edge as far as that workhorse quality and performance. Whereas Dominic Mysterio, you know, I think we can count on all the time, you know, on our hands, all the times that he was in a wrestling ring, uh, last year, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, really coming into his own as, you know, a, a performer is big, especially to do it in the WWE when there is such an emphasis on entertainment, um, yeah. and really getting out of the shadows of his dad. It's a, it's a big deal. Um, and I think he's also leaning into the silliness. And as we've talked about 2023 prison Dom is leaning into the, you know, kind of the ridiculousness of it. So, you know, he's an early runner for the cookie sheet of work. Correct. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And if you haven't seen prison Dom, you've got to, you got to, you've got to, you've got to, it is so good. So for those of you who don't watch the WWE like me, Dusty, can you explain to us what you mean by prison, Tom? Yes. Well, it goes all the way back to Thanksgiving. Dominic and Rhea showed up and and raised some hell. You whipped Rey Mysterio a little bit, and they left. And so they showed up on Christmas at Grandpa's house looking to pull the same stunt. But Rey Mysterio had 911 on speed dial. And so he called the cops. And he had Dominic arrested for coming in and assaulting him in front of the Christmas tree. And Dominic had to go to jail. And now he's got a teardrop tattoo and a bandana and he dresses like a cholo. And it is so freaking good. And, and he pretends to be hard. He's like, I was in jail and they was messing with me. You know what I did? They said they was going to punch a hole in my face. So I jumped up. I slapped him awake and said, we got a problem. There wasn't any problem after that. And the Finn Balor would be like, "Damn, Dom, you so hard." <laughs> <laughs> and it's like it's almost it's like watching fun. the movie Rushmore, like the play they put on. Yes. And, but it's so good, and like, oh. and, and he's so in on the joke, and he has completely turned his entertainment value around in the last year. From where he was last year to this year is a completely different spot. It's incredible. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah, he is. I mean, he he's on a trajectory now where he's definitely going to reach higher heights than than almost any of these other guys. We will see what Commander and NGD and Black Taurus do. Uh, we we do need to point out that Lindsay was also nominated, and uh, unfortunately, uh, he just is not on the same trajectory as the rest of these guys. So I, as much as yeah. I, I think. I th- as much as I think he can get there and may well get there this year because this will be a full year with the uh, most interesting luchador thing going on and lots of lots of energy behind uh, Lucha Libre, in my opinion. But we'll see. We'll have to see. Just pay attention to future episodes of This Week in Lucha Libre. Uh, this Week in... Yeah. Not This Week in Lucha Libre. That's our segment. Uh, this is a weekly podcast. There we go. Yeah. There it is. No. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, congratulations, though, uh, to our winner, Black Taurus. Uh, I know, though, there's already a front runner conversation with Dominic Mysterio, uh, in the future. In what category, though? That will be what will, remains to be seen 
in 2023. Uh, up next for our next category, we have trios of the year, which we'll kick it off to Brendan to introduce our nominees. All right. Yeah. So this is the trios of the year. As some of you may have paid attention to the last category, we did have our first ever trio in in the rising star category. So you can anticipate they were in trio of the year as well. So NG, let's just start right there. NGD was one of our nominees. La Impressa. Um, we never did decide which version of La Impressa. I think it's just all of them. Um, Legato del Fantasma and Death Triangle. And, uh, so our, our honorable mention is La Impressa and possibly as a result of them not having a fully gelled format. Uh, they, they just didn't quite get the same amount of, uh, points and votes that the, the rest of the, the groups got here. I couldn't uh, vote for them because of Jeff Jarrett. <laughs> do it. Way, way to stick to your principles. I do. I do appreciate that. It is. It is a, a thing. Jeff Jarrett does sort of taint anything he touches, and he really <laughs> likes to say the word basura when he's in Mexico. So you know. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but then our next highest vote getter was NGD. Um, again, I'm, I'm a little, we'll go on about that in a second. I'm a little surprised they didn't do better, but we'll, we'll get there. And then Legato del Fantasma is our runner up and our trio of the year is the Death Triangle. So, um, I see who voted for that. So you guys can pick, <laughs> pick which one of you wants to start talking about why you voted for Death Triangle. Wow. Well. I voted for Death Triangle because they were fucking awesome this year. <laughs> I mean, seriously, they so cool. I I wasn't sold on the idea of Death Triangle when it started. I thought the Lucha Bros were cool enough that they didn't really need Pack, but he adds like a different level of intensity and fire to what they do. And we've covered it before. It all out. There was the fight situation between CM Punk's people and the Elite, and when they needed to get the titles off of the Elite and get them on to somebody else, they chose the Death Triangle. They they were there when AEW was in the clutch, and my God, they were impressive. They did so much this year. Then we got to the best of seven series between Death Triangle and the Elite. And there may be some recency bias involved because it's still going on. We haven't had our seventh match yet. But those first six matches were incredible. It's not a stretch at all to say that it's the best, best of seven in wrestling ever. Just incredible stuff. The things they do, they highlighted and elevated the titles. When they were looking to build the titles, they put them on Death Triangle because the elite weren't there. And they did so much with them to make them feel important and special and worth fighting for. Just everything you want to see in a championship. And I thought they did that this year so well. And we didn't really see much solo Lucha Bros, it was mostly Death Triangle, or not solo, I guess, much tag team Lucha Bros this year. It was mostly Death Triangle or, you know, single Or solo, matches. except a couple yeah. big shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And we just didn't really have much tag team. We got that early match this year with uh, Jurassic Express, and then uh, Phoenix was injured. We didn't really see him till May. And, but Death Triangle did so much in the second half of the year that I felt like it really put them ahead. Being champions really put them ahead. And, I mean, we, we also saw championships on the Wave of Generation on Dinamita, but that was very close to the end of the year. And I, I really think that just for match quality, story quality, the intensity they bring to the ring, the the stories between the individual members where you saw Phoenix cheat to win in one of the matches and really get broken up about it. He didn't like that. But At Penn the encouragement no of Pac. Yeah. Which is, yeah, that was the thing I wanted to, to comment on, on Death Triangle that you were talking about. The fans of American wrestling that like the storyline and the, the long build to the probable inevitable betrayal by somebody in this faction are loving this team as a result of this. Like, 
they're probably going to lose against the Bucks in the last match. I'm sorry, but yeah, you know. yeah. Well, I mean, they were just kind of placeholders for the elite yeah. when they were in a bind. But, but it's uh, what yeah. they did with it and their time yeah. there that made well. It and, but and and the but instead of it just being empty and hollow, now there's a possible story that can come yes. out of. Yeah. 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 And we right. even so, talked about how in, originally we thought, you know, Death Triangle would be great um, inaugural trios, you know, champions. And so when the Bucks and Kenny Omega had to vacate the, the titles, you know, it felt like this was a story that they probably should have been telling to begin with. And um, this is probably the, the best elevation they've had um, in over a, a year since they won the, the tag team titles. Um, and uh, again, yeah, the, the match quality, even this best of seven series, when you think about that, uh, uh, along just too with being able to really transition as strong champions to the forefront where we've also seen in AEW, a lot of other championships kind of get lost in the mix and they were able to keep those trios titles pretty relevant yeah. um, and important um, you know, during the reign. So that I think is also fairly impressive. Indeed. Um, so we did have, I wanted to, since we didn't talk as much about it, the reason that NGD was in both categories, uh, is they, they broke away from CMLL this year, made a giant, or the end of last year, I'm not sure anyway, but most of this year has been about their presence in the Indies and, and, uh, AAA. And they they basically took over Poder del Norte's place as being the premier trio in that promotion. They had titles for a little while. I think that no, they still have the titles. Uh, and uh, they seem to. That's why I was. They were on this giant trajectory upward. Also, that because um, because AAA and CMLL both are still big on, on the just having tons of trios matches. The, they are getting much more exposure as a trio than Death Triangle or Legato del Fantasma. Uh, and uh, so that was kind of where I was at with, with where I wanted to go. I wanted to cover them for both categories there. Mm -hmm. But, um, Miranda, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Legato del Fantasma? Well, the, the big news with Agato was the fact that they transitioned from NXT to SmackDown. And, um, in general, I mean, they still were close but no cigar when it came to championship gold in NXT. Santos, uh, earlier in the year was, um, you know, competing for the NXT championship. Uh, Joaquin and Raul. Um, I'm sorry, Cruz, uh, were in the, uh, running for the NXT tag team titles, didn't, you know, get to them. Uh, so when they did end up moving to SmackDown, it was something that was, you know, highly anticipated, um, and something that we thought that, you know, I think we were all excited for, um, Again, still their placement right now in, on SmackDown is one where I think we're still all kind of figuring out, uh, and including themselves, where they fall and how the image of Legato the Fantasma is supposed to, to portray. One of the big things that really did happen, though, was, um, you know, not so much in the trios news, but just as the faction news with Electra Lopez staying in NXT and uh, them working with uh, Zelina uh, uh, Queen Selena as their kind of new, um, you know, manager. So that too, I think there's still divided opinions on that. But I think in general, as we've talked about too, surviving the machine that is WWE is always an impressive feat. And for Legato to continue on forward, especially moving from NXT to uh, SmackDown, is a huge accomplishment. Absolutely. There we are. Congratulations to our winners for Trios of the Year, AEW's Death Triangle. In our next category, we have Tag Team of the Year. Dusty, remind us, who are our nominees? Our nominees were Lucha Bros, Penta and Phoenix, Los Hermanos Lee, Dragon Lee and Trilistico, Los Vipers, 
That's Latigo and Toxin and La Rebellion, Bestia, Say Say Say, and Mecha Wolf. And our first place winner was Los Hermanos Lee. Our second place winner was La Rebellion. And third place winner was Los Vipers. I voted personally first place. It was a unanimous sweep for first place for Los Hermanos Lee. We all voted first place. And these guys had such a big year. They won titles in the crash. They won titles in PWR. They won titles in AAA, uh, which was crazy. After they won the titles, Dragon Lee announces that he is signed with WWE. He's going there in January. And they remove the titles. Like, we're going to have a title tag title tournament now. And so crazy. Such a huge moment. These guys had big moments all year. They were in AEW. We mentioned PWR. We mentioned The Crash. They were in AAA. Uh, they were everywhere. ROH. And, ROH, yeah. yeah. And, and they were champions a lot of these places. They're relinquishing the titles many places because of the the signing. And it was just so cool to see their stratospheric rise this year. Interesting that Trilistico didn't get signed. He sent it over to Japan to wrestle for Pro Wrestling Noah right now. Um, but Dragon Lee, what a year for him. And I think that part of my vote as Tag Team of the Year not only recognizes what they've done, but the big year that Dragon Lee had and the signing and how all that stood out against everything and really gave them the biggest lucha moment at the end of the year. Yeah. More people were talking about that than almost any other lucha moment at the cusp of the year, or even any wrestling moment. It was big news. It was on ESPN, uh, Mass Republic. You know, they Kevin Kleinrock and Ruben Zamora, and they kind of help run the Lucha Central. And I mean, everything's connected there, but they helped run, do the negotiation process for the contract negotiation and the visa work. So cool. Just a huge, huge thing made news internationally everywhere. And Dragon Lee, I really think has the ceiling to be as big or bigger than Rey Mysterio, especially if they properly merchandise him to kids. I think Dragon Lee could really, I mean, his knees are in better shape than Rey's were at his age. <laughs> uh, yeah, and he he has a better gimmick that's kid-friendly than on yes. Friday or anything. <laughs> so, yeah. It's absolutely yeah. true. Yeah, but you, you make good points. I mean, Dusty, you, you encompassed it all. You know, they, uh, competed, uh, you know, in the U.S. and, <clears throat> and uh, in Mexico, champions on both sides of the bold, uh, of the border. But I really do think what put them over the edge was, um, you know, the events happening right at the end of the year at, at AAA United Champions where they, uh, won the AAA tag team titles, um, as kind of one last big hurrah and Dragon Lee announcing his signing uh, to WWE. Um, I think even without the WWE signing it, they probably would have, um, you know, gotten the vote. I know again, unanimous, we all voted first place for them. Um, but still, you know, being able to win the AAA championships um, at the end of the year, even though they did have to vacate them, uh, but winning those. And and I think that was also, you know, maybe AAA's, uh, AAA's way of acknowledging, you know, uh, Los Hermanos Lee for, you know, the team that they are and allowing them to win it, even though they, they had to vacate it. So I think, yeah, they had a... a a great, you know, a year. You know, La Rebellion, um, in kind of a, a distant second, but I think as we talked about titles, um, in this conversation make a difference with them being the, the reigning NWA tag team champions, um, and some of the, the work that they did that's, you know, I think held really, uh, you know, no pun intended, their weight in gold. Um, but again, I think for all the work, that the Los Hermanos Lee did and the way they ended the year, it was very hard to uh, look at anyone else in that number one spot. So I just want to address La Rebellion. H had they done everything that they did on the same scale as Los mm. Hermanos Lee, True. right? Because they were working in smaller promotions, yeah. uh, but doing fantastic matches and, really make it, they brought Lucha Libre to Southern Wrestling, which is something that hasn't happened for decades. 
Uh, so, you know, yeah, you have, you, you, they, you could have had, they could have had a much better shot, but they, the, really the, for me, the reason they didn't get a, uh, get a first place vote is just because they weren't quite on that, that scale, even though their work was. Good point. Really good point. Well, once again, congratulations to our winners for Tag Team of the Year, Los Hermanos Lee, Dralistico, and Dragon Lee. Uh, make sure you stay tuned to the Lucha Central Weekly Podcast. Dusty, as you mentioned, uh, due to Dragon Lee signing, they have are already looking to have vacate some of their titles. I know AAA announced that uh, they vacated the tag team championships. Uh, Pro Wrestling Revolution has already announced uh, that they have vacated their tag team championships and that uh, they are going to be crowning new champions on March 11th. Uh, no news yet from Crash, but believe that's probably going to be in alignment with what we see. So we definitely are going to be talking about those as we learn more about them on future episodes of the Lucha Central Weekly Podcast. Up next, we are getting into Luchadora of the Year. We had uh, five very strong nominees in this category, starting off with Taya Valkyrie, Roxanne Perez, Lady Shani, Fabi Apache, and Raquel Gonzalez. So in the honorable mention area, we had Raquel Gonzalez. In third place, we had Fabi Apache. I'm sorry, no, in uh, third place, sorry, we had Taya Valkyrie. In second place, we had Fabi Apache. And in first place, Roxanne Perez from NXT. Uh, I know she got a few of your guys' first votes, uh, Brendan and Dusty. So I want to get your thoughts on, uh, you know, your uh, decision on, on voting her number one and kind of also, too, kind of how things shook out. Um, with the um, with the voting in this category, so it it was an easy choice for me. She had the biggest year. She absolutely she everywhere she appeared this in this last year, she was at the top of the card and winning gold. Like none of these other ladies, even though they're all very good, has the they had that level of consistency. So I mean, you just had to reward yeah. that. Well, and she started the year as Ring of Honor champion, ended the year as NXT champion. Yeah. I mean, what a huge year. And she's only yeah. like 20, 21, maybe 21 now. I yeah. mean, she's so young. She's one of the future stars of wrestling. She could have easily won Rising Star if she had been in that category. I, I just think the sky's the limit for her. We haven't seen everything she can do yet. The fact that she was the chosen one to beat Mandy Rose is huge. I mean, just the confidence WWE and Triple H must have in her is ridiculous. And, I mean, incredible things. I really think she's going to be maybe the biggest star in women's wrestling sometime in the next five years, if not one of the biggest stars. And to see her on this ascent is such a big deal, and I feel like we have to recognize that talent. So that's why she got my first place vote, is just the talent that we see, the championships, everything that you look for that you know kind of stands as an accolade for a professional wrestler. She has all of it already, and she's 21 years old. It's crazy. <laughs> and, I mean, she's the complete package. In a way that so few aren't. She can talk. She can wrestle. She looks great. I mean, she's got all the, she checks all the boxes that you would want and, and just a, a consummate champion. And so like, I, that's why she got my vote is she just had the biggest year, the strongest momentum, the highest climb, exactly. everything you could want she had. Yeah, the only hesitation I had is that she did spent the majority of her time wrestling. American style instead of Lucha Libre, like most of the rest of the ladies on this list. But that's very fair. Uh, yeah, I, very, I, very I, fair. I, yeah. Uh, and I want to mention uh, our, our two other um, kind of placeholder or uh, placed women here with Fabi Apache. And I think as we talked about, really, this comes down to a, a very big change, uh, a decision to um, move away from AAA to CMLL. 
Um, and, and once again, I really wanted you guys to both be able to share a bit of the implications of that for those who may not really understand why that is such a big deal and it, how yeah. that could have really impacted. I mean, the fact that she got, you know, second, second place, um, and with uh, a smaller amount of matches compared to some of the other, uh, women on this list. Absolutely. Well, oh, go ahead, yeah. Brenda. So I just, I'll set the plate for you on this. She is a perennial on this list because she is, uh, the Apache name mm-hmm. is synonymous with women's wrestling in Mexico. Like you, if you're thinking of most of the big names, you're thinking of Taya, you're thinking of Fabi, and you're thinking of Lady Apache. And even if you're old enough, you're thinking of their, their sister. So, I mean, it, it, you just, she was already there, and then uh, Dusty. I'll let you go, and we'll see if you're gonna. I think you're gonna cover the other part. I was gonna say. So yeah. Well, her work rate is amazing and speaks for itself. But she didn't really necessarily have a match this year that you're like, oh, this Fabi Apache match. This is where it's at. And and so like I I can understand the issue there, but. It's almost unheard of what she's done, especially for a woman. She wrestled for AAA literally her entire career, like 20-something years, 22 years, something like that. She'd wrestled for AAA. She left. She bet on herself. She went to CMLL, and she's very prominently placed there. I mean, as high as any woman. And she does wrestle for CMLL. She, As far as I know, she's independent and hasn't signed with CMLL. She's just on a per-appearance deal to kind of keep her options open. But it also helps politically with the CMLL AAA thing. I, it, it's complicated. but Well, she, yeah, to that yeah. point, it's unheard of. This yeah. We've seen lots of people leave CMLL to go to the Indies and AAA, but almost nobody leaves AAA in this day and age. Like, it has happened historically a few times, but almost nobody goes the other direction these days. So, yeah. And it's always a huge name. I mean, it's only like your Dr. Wagner's, your uh, Ultimo Guerrero. I mean, people like of that stature level are the only people that have the ability to work indie and work CMLL. It's a big deal, and and she's treated like a big deal as one. I mean, it's it's what you would expect for one of the top stars in lucha libre, and that transcends gender, and that makes her so important as a luchadora of the year because she's really a trailblazer in what she's doing down there. It seems like maybe not a big deal, you know, or not a big deal in the United States, but it's definitely a big deal in Mexico. It's definitely a big deal in Lucha Libre. And any woman that wrestles in Mexico has to be behind her because, you know, going and getting that money is what wrestling's all about. Kevin Nash will tell you that. <laughs> the things that are really the money and the miles. You got to get paid. And she's out there getting paid. She's getting that bag. And you have to respect her for that. And, and to bet on herself again. I mean, such a gamble, and it paid off because of her talent and her perseverance and her history, and all of that combined into her year in 2020. Yeah. Really make her feel more important than she had. And I just want to throw uh, in our third place, Taya um, Valkyrie. I mean, this is someone who last year wasn't, you know, on the radar because of, um, you know, not, not having very many appearances on NXT. She was part of one of the, the big releases back, um, in 2021. And then, uh, or I'm sorry, in 20, I think it was early 2022, um, or 2021, but, Going back to it, um, you know, she did end up kind of taking her rightful place back in AAA, uh, beating Diana Parazzo back in April to become the AAA Reina de Reina's champion. And from there, you know, on a roll, um, with also then becoming, um, part of the knockouts tag team champions, uh, becoming the first ever MLW women's featherweight champion, um, competing, uh, you know, in the <laughs> NWA. We had that, uh, you know, almost dream match possibly between, uh, Taya and Thunder Rosa at one point, um, that, that was going to be happening. And so there was, you know, really Taya came back with a vengeance this year and she came and she Absolutely. wrestled as the Taya that we know. 
that we have adored, that we have seen, that we knew would get her to that higher caliber level. And when she came back into the independent scene and especially back home in AAA, this is the Taya that, you know, it has entertained us for years. And again, it's it, it doesn't. You know, getting connect, having a reconnect as Rena to Rena's champion is just kind of, you know, what we knew. And, and really that title right now is, is truly meant for, for Taya. Like I, it's, it's hard to look at anybody else right now in the AAA roster, um, who brings <laughs> yeah. that much, you know, dominance to, uh, the, the Reina to Reina's championship. So, uh, someone else, I mean, who really have collected championships, um, all over the independent scene, a very, very big year for Taya. Uh, it, it says a lot too, that, uh, Taya has such command and respect and it's so much in the forefront of people's brains when they're thinking about women's wrestling that when Sasha Banks appeared with her new name at Wrestle Kingdom and it had the same last name as Monet, everybody said, uh, what the fuck was uh, Taya, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. No, that was one of my first thoughts was like, really? <laughs> But everybody said it. Like, people in the UK were saying it. People in Australia were saying it. Like, people nowhere connected to Mexico were still thinking of that Frankie Monet gimmick that had so little momentum in WWE and NXT that when she came out with that name, when, what, I can't even remember. Do you remember the, the full name they, that she's using now, Dusty? Is it Mercedes? It's, it's, I guess Mercedes. it's technically money. Yeah, Mercedes Monet. Yeah, yeah. Monet. Yeah, Monet, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it's, it's an interesting pronunciation. Yeah. <laughs> That's, but yeah, it's, it's still, everybody's, the, I, just to bring it back, that they thought a lot of Taya when that, that name was used. I would say this was definitely one of the most competitive categories for voting. The voting um, was much closer than yes. it was on some yeah. of the others. Yeah, yeah, definitely a lot. So uh, again, big congratulations though to uh, our winner for Luchadora of the Year, Roxanne Perez. Up next, we have our Luchador of the Year category. Brendan, go ahead, let us know our nominees and winner. Okay, so we had quite the loaded category for Luchador of the Year. This was another one that was pretty tight in the voting. Uh, we had both of the Lucha Bros, Penta and Phoenix. We had Hijo del Vikingo, and we had Bandito. And uh, I want to make sure I got this right. Our third place one was was uh penta so you already know this is going to be interesting because normally or not normally in the last couple of years he has been higher in the consideration our second place is bandito and the actual luchador of the year that got all of the the uh the points was vikingo hijo del vikingo and um Dusty, go ahead and tell us about uh, what the, what these results say to you. Well, I think it a speaks to how strongly Vikingo showed off his talent this year and his placement. You know, being the AAA Mega Campion champion, um, big deal. You know, he's kind of got the top championship in the company, and AAA really treats him like a top guy. There's a kind of an embargo on live streaming his matches. Um, you know, they're saving that for AAA. And even though I do think it's hindering him, you can't argue they're not treating him like he's very special, like a very big deal. And Vikingo does wrestle like a big deal. He feels like a big deal. He looks like a big deal. He did not get that international moment we thought he'd get against Kenny Omega. You know, Kenny had to relinquish the title and things you know, happen. Yeah, things happen. <laughs> But he really rebounded off of that. He's been injured a couple times this year, but they let him rest and heal up. He comes back better than ever. His ring work is just ridiculous. I mean, he defies physics. He defies gravity. 
you can't make sense of the things you see him do. It's just incredible. And that kind of suspension of disbelief when you see him in the moment is so important to wrestling and what makes wrestling special, (laughs) what makes it work. And just that connection with him on that level as a fan where you're like, wow, I can't wait to see Bandito again. And can't wait to see Vikingo again. Can't wait to see Penta again. They all had that, but I really felt that Vikingo had it, you know, just a little more than everybody else this year. Part of it was his championship placement. Part of it was that we didn't see Penta in as much singles action this year, uh, especially didn't see Phoenix in as much singles action this year. But I thought just in terms of everything he did, Vikingo was the guy. He's the guy everybody talks about. He's the guy everybody wants to wrestle. When he comes to your town, it's the guy, you know, the, your best guy in your local fed gets to wrestle when he makes the indie appearance. And I, I just think that he's so special and feels so special and that he's on his way up. This will not be the last time he's nominated for Luchador of the Year, I guarantee it. It's probably not going to be the last time he wins Luchador of the Year, but it was the first year he showed us what he could do, and not only did he deliver on the promise, he exceeded it. And that, it, it's just all tied together to make him so special, so important, and all of those qualities, in my opinion, make him Luchador of the Year. Wow. Um, I, I wanted to touch on something that you kind of point, uh, pointed out. Uh, we have by, by we have this unique time here. We have Vikingo, who has reached the pinnacle. We have Bandito, who was the guy a couple of years ago, and he hasn't really slowed down, just... To your point, it felt like Vikingo had more mem- momentum. We still have the Lucha Bros. We still uh, we have Commander coming up. Like the the I keep saying Lucha Libre is going to be big, but here is your illustration of it. Like you have all of these guys um, that are are at that point where they're commanding that much respect here in the states that all they all they really need is the big venue like a WrestleMania weekend show. And uh, you could build, you could sell tickets just on announcing any one of those guys on on the card. So I think we're in good shape there. Um, I, you know, I just so I have less to say about about all of these votes because the I mean, it, the, I feel like almost everybody on this category is self explanatory and yeah, and, uh, yeah, you know, but. <laughs> Miranda, I've been rambling, so I'm gonna let you say. No, I mean, I think Dusty said it beautifully as far as, you know, why Vikingo, um, you know, got the, the votes to become, you know, number one. Just really quick as far as Bandito, you know, he too, I mean, um, Brendan, you've talked about some people coming in from this, this other side of, you know, the, the death of Ring of Honor. And Bandito was one where I think a lot of, of, uh, fans were curious about, you know, what would happen with Bandito. Uh, but I think that towards the end of this year made such a huge impression with American audiences, um, both through MLW and AEW. While still running his own school and promotion, which yes. is, cannot be understated how much mm-hmm. of effort that all of that takes. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that that's huge with someone who could break through to American audiences, um, after, uh, you know, really his career taking off as, as much as it did in Ring of Honor. Um, you know, we thought that that would be kind of the, the path for him. And when Ring of Honor went away, um, you know, especially for a lot of, of luchadors in general, thinking that we weren't going, there wasn't going to be a path for them. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of great visibility and that Bandito Chris Jericho match, you know, really, you know, did wonders for his career. Absolutely. Um, so in, in ways that we've talked about, you know, Vikingo not so much being able to break through American audiences and that's for various reasons, much of it more obligatory with AAA. We have Bandito who I think is kind of a rarity in being able to break through to, through a, a U.S. based product and promotion, um, in really a short amount of time. Absolutely. I felt like the only thing that kept Bandito from a possible 
top spot or a higher placement was the fact that it felt like they didn't capitalize as quickly as they could have or should have on his match with Chris Jericho. I mean, after that match, people that weren't even Lucha fans were like, oh my gosh, this Bandito guy is incredible. And then we didn't see a real quick follow-up, and I felt like that may have hindered his momentum a little bit at the end of the year there. I think he'll catch up on it, but in the immediate present, it just feels a little different. I'm going to throw this out there. Uh, there are some Bandito matches that they've been filming for Dark. So the fans that are out there wanting to see more Bandito, you have to go on to the, the YouTubes and watch AEW Dark. Uh, they will put his name front and center because they know that'll get clicks. So you can find him real easy. But there are some matches this year with Bandito. So uh, that kind of affected the voting, too, is that he didn't do a lot near the end of the year and started to rise back up after after January. Very good point. We'll see. I mean, like you mentioned, Dusty, I mean, both with Vikingo, but a lot of people on this list, you know, we may be nominating again in 2023. <laughs> so who knows where the voting will fall out. And I'm sure there'll be new people, too, that may be on this list in 2023. Uh, but once again... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, once again, let's give this moment to our reigning AAA Mega Campeón. And the winner of our Luchador of the Year, Hijo de Vikingo. And our final category, the big one, Match of the Year. Dusty, go ahead, let our listeners know again, remind them of our nominees and our winners. Our nominees, first up, Match of the Year, Pinta versus Viano for Mask versus Mask Match. Uh, that's November... Th- or- October, rather, the 15th, 2022, at Triple Mania Chapter 3. Next up was Vikingo versus Phoenix from the same night in a Mega Campion Championship match. Third match was Ray and Dominic Mysterio versus Miz and Logan Paul at WrestleMania 38 on April the 1st, 2022. Our fourth match was Ricochet versus Santos Escobar for the SmackDown World Cup on December the 2nd, 2022. And our final match was Sammy Guevara versus Cody Rhodes and a ladder championship match on AEW Wednesday Night Dynamite, January the 26th, 2022. And our third place match, I guess I should mention our honorable mention matches. They both got one point. Sammy versus Cody and Mysterios versus Miz and Logan Paul. Our third place candidate third place winner match of the year ricochet versus santos escobar at the smackdown world cup tournament second place is vikingo versus phoenix and first place penta versus viano for mask versus mask a place this match this was another unanimous first place match for me personally i chose this match because of the emotional connection you see yep. so yep. much like aerial and acrobatic lucha libre and that's kind of what gets over in the united states because of the visual appeal but you lose some of that hard hitting um just yeah emotional i felt connected to this match you did not know who would win it could just as easily have been penta as viano Either way, I mean, and it felt like it could go either way. The match felt like it could go either way. It, the stakes were high. It felt so important. I mean, it felt like the most important of place this match to me since we oh, saw yeah. Dr. Wagner versus Psycho Clown. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I, yeah, I really absolutely. think it was the most important mask versus mask match since then. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I have trouble thinking of anything that rivals it for that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was really that important. And even though Vikingo versus Phoenix was a technical masterpiece, if you're all about work rate and just jaw-dropping, awe-inspiring moments, that match was it. It was incredible. (laughs) But the emotional connection for me just wasn't there, and not in the same way. And just I was so personally invested in Pinta versus Viano. And 
as much as I thought Viano was going to win, I, I or lose rather, I also thought Viano was going to win. He did a lot of crying before the match, you know, around the circuit, and I thought, well, maybe he's going to lose that mask. He's crying a lot, but then I thought, you know, maybe he's just getting worked up about coming back and being excited and going to win and you know leave on top. That would make me a little teary too. So the the build up the the investment, the the possibility, when the whole tournament was announced, you knew Pinta was going to make it to the finals, but <laughs> it just it seemed predestined he was going to lose his mask, and I was so invested in the whole thing, and just that investment to me made it a first place candidate. Um, yeah, I don't know how you guys felt about the, the order of things, especially that I will admit for third place, I voted for Sammy versus Cody. I thought the latter <laughs> match was incredible. If you go back to it, that was really the last time we were super hyped on Sammy. He felt so new and refreshing then and felt like the sky was the limit and he didn't have the kind of go home heat that he has now. <laughs> and, and so I chose that, but you guys both picked ricochet versus escobar so if you'd like to discuss it i mean yeah no i I just think that too like that match happened in such a perfect time where um you know the emphasis well one just being able to reference their history um you know and and for for lucha underground lucha underground fans to know that and and for wwe to allude to that i mean we never thought that that would happen um but they are just fire in the ring it was such a great just great uh, captivating tv match and i think that's one of the the rarities well outside of sammy and cody but i think like for what it is you know outside of our other nominees this was a you know tv match um and i think that it shows how much a either lucha influence or even lucha match can be successful on a national television platform and how you can, you know, leverage that in and utilize that on a, on a, you know, in, in a product like WWE when done it right. And also with, you know, again, WWE is in a spot now where they can do odes and references for, you know, those hardcore wrestling fans, um, or deep cut fans while also being entertaining for modern fans or, or fans who aren't familiar. And, they just have really great chemistry and work in the ring. And, um, you know, again, for WWE, that's not known for, you know, their quote unquote bigger matches. Um, this one was one that I, you know, it just had a, a lot of components that for me um, put on a, a quality match, but also showcase this translation of Lucha Libre to a wider audience. Yeah, it's um, and and there's more on that. Uh, for me, it did have, I did fully admit, it has the recency bias, which is why I, I put it in the mix in the first place. But this represents, uh, because it was such a good match, and because it was so well placed and so well timed, where WWE was bringing fans back and and uh, really kind of revitalizing themselves, and this was one of their tentpole matches for that. It also is a uh, uh, kick the door wide open to allow more lucha libre to happen in the WWE, and I feel mm-hmm. like that is uh, that is the most important part of it. Like, I mean, both the uh, both the first and second place winners were were uh, inarguably more exciting, more emotionally involving, more deserving of the higher higher accolades that they they got. But this match is important, and I think. Uh, and in next year's year roundup, we may still be referencing this match as the beginning of what WWE is doing because they, uh, they they've got they've got Dragon Lee now. There's uh, always the tease that Andrade may go back to WWE. There may be lucha, so much lucha libre in the WWE by this time next year, and it will undoubtedly, if we get that be as a direct result of the success of this match. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, yeah. You know, uh, and in general, this, this is, was a category of a variety of different matches, 
you know, from some that were real technical, uh, outstanding matches to those that invoked emotion to those that we felt kind of broke new ground. Yeah. And so I really, you know, think that, of course, there's, I'm sure, you know, there's, there will be comments and feedback of so many other matches that could have been nominated. So many matches that could have been nominated. Yeah. We know, but please we tell know. us anyway, because that will help us remember to take better notes next year so that we can <laughs> at least. <laughs> yeah. Well, and eventually we have to narrow it down, too. So, but you know. I, uh, I yeah. do want to call back to when we covered the Triple Mania. I didn't realize you all were going to agree with me. I thought we were going to split the vote a little more. I had I called my shot. I said I was going to vote for Penta versus Viano as match of the year, and Dusty took the nomination before I did. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, but I said it because like like all the things Dusty said, I was emotionally connected in that mm-hmm. match. Yes. While I yeah. was, I while I was on the edge of my seat for Vikingo and Phoenix, I was emotionally connected, and that is what I want out of a wrestling yes. match, and that's what I said back in the day. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's, uh, that's why I'm we all voted for that. Me. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> why we all voted for that. That's a rarity, I think, too, in Lucha Libre, where we see more either brutal matches or uh, high-flying, where it invokes some type of emotion of maybe awe or, you know, maybe wince, <laughs> but uh, emotion of respect. An emotion, yeah. you know, of of honor, of um, you know, history, like, and really too, it was one of the best displays of an Apuestas match all year, um, and the stakes, you know, everything culminating to that match too. I think too, it's not just what happened in that match; it was everything that led to it and the history behind it. So I think, you know, it was looking beyond it, and I think that too made it. Such of you know again we all have our different uh, aspects of things that we like out of wrestling and things but uh, we all ended up agreeing on what this match meant to us as fans to you know those who have a place in in history with lucha libre and and ultimately the emotion that it invoked in us. So. All right. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, once again, just a, a big congratulations to our winner for Match of the Year, uh, Penta versus uh, Viano uh, from Triple Mania. We made it. Yeah, we made it. Yeah. So <laughs> there we are for the end of our 2022 end of year awards. Please let us know what you think of uh, our nominees and our uh, picks for the year um, through social media. Um, You can reach uh, the Lucha Central Weekly Podcast and, of course, Lucha Central at uh, Lucha Central on Instagram and Twitter and at Lucha. I'm sorry, Instagram and Facebook and at Lucha Central com on Twitter. Uh, and also don't forget to check out Lucha Central's YouTube page, uh, that has hours of interviews, matches, previous episodes of the Lucha Central weekly podcast and others from the Lucha Central podcast network, uh, as well as, uh, previous expo luchas and much, much more. And while you're at it, though, you can go ahead and check out luchacentral.com and with a little bit more information on what you can find there, I'm going to, kick it off to brendan all right so if you're listening to this and you haven't visited luchacentral.com it's really time to do it luchacentral.com is the online home for lucha libre where you can get all of the top news in english and in spanish find the best curated video content and original content not seen anywhere else find when lucha libre events would be happening in your area You can find photo galleries from top photographers covering Lucha Libre around the world. It's a place to have your voices heard from weekly polls to annual awards, seen and read by top executives in all of the major Lucha Libre promotions across the globe. And on top of all of that, it's free, 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 free. LuchaCentral.com, your centralized place for all things Lucha Libre. And as we talked about earlier, if you have any feedback for us on, well, our nominees and ultimately how we voted for our end of year awards, don't forget to reach out to us 
uh, on social media. Uh, we'll let you know right now where you can find us, starting with Dusty. Let, can you let our listeners know where they can find you? I am on Instagram at Dusty Murphy, and I am on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Dusty Murphy. And, Brenda, can you let our listeners know where they can find you? I am 321 T-Shirt Guy. That's the numbers, 321. And then T-Shirt Guy is all spelled out. I am on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. And I'm all over the Twitters. And me, Miranda Morales. You can find me at the hashtag Miranda on Instagram and Facebook. Not on Twitter. Go ahead and reach out to Brenda (laughs) instead. Uh, but make sure again, feel free to reach out to us, follow us, let us know your thoughts on our nominees and ultimate winners for our end of year awards and anything else you think you want to let us know or talk about. We're happy to uh, connect with you on social media and we close one chapter, one book in 2022 and on to 2023 already going to be a wild year ahead and it's sizzling start it is just 10 days into it so (laughs) um, make sure you continue to listen to the lucha central weekly podcast again you can find us at lucha central or on luchacentral.com as well as our streaming partners at thechairshot.com and of course all major podcast streaming platforms like uh Google Play, <laughs> iTunes, Spotify, uh, and and all of those streaming services. So uh, thank you all so much for listening to this week's show. Happy 2022, now into 2023. Happy New Year. And uh, for Brendan Barr and Dusty Murphy, I'm Miranda Morales. Thank you all so much, and we will be with you next week.